if my people will humble themselves and pray and turn from their sins, then I will hear and I will forgive and I will heal their land. On this day, I remember my nephew, Marine Sergeant Jesse Strong, who gave his life for his country on January 26, 2005 in Hildatha, Iraq. Would you take the time now as we go into silent prayer with thanksgiving to remember those who have paid the greatest price? Let us pray. Lord, we remember. We remember the life given that all might have life. And in following your most perfect example, we remember the lives that have been given so that we might experience and enjoy the common good. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to never forget. We pray these things with one heart and one mind and one spirit, and all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen. As you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 12, which is our passage for the day, I have a few brief pastoral words to put us on the same page in our common life together. One is to let you know that as is often the case during the summertime when we have different rhythms uh, to our life together, uh, that is often the time when members of our staff find the opportunity for sabbatical rest. Last summer, Jim Lures and Paul Becker both were able to enter into Sabbath rest during the summer. And this summer, uh, Cheryl Montanelli, our Director of Communications, will be having a month-long sabbatical in the middle of the summer and our own pastor, Betsy, after eight years as our associate pastor, has well-deserved a time to exhale a little bit. And so starting on June the 18th and going all the way through August the 15th, Pastor Betsy will be on a sabbatical rest. Now, a few words of sabbatical. That is to say, there are always those of us who believe we are the exception to the rule. That is to say, I know she's on sabbatical, but she will want to hear from me. Well, that may be the case, but I am saying as her boss, please don't do that. Give her the ability to have some space and some time. In fact, even over the next two weeks, you may be tempted to say, oh, I've got to get in there before she takes off. I would just simply say her schedule is pretty full over those next two weeks. And if it's an emergency, Pastor Paul and I would love to see you, Pastor Kevin and Karen. We've got other pastors here who can be of assistance for you. Give her the ability to get things organized, have that time away, and come back to us refreshed and renewed in August. Now, the only exception to that is going to be Roger. Roger, you get to be with her all that you want during that Sabbath rest. But no church business, none of that. Now, if you run into her in Giant Eagle, it doesn't have to be awkward and painful. You don't have to hide in the frozen produce section. You can go up and talk like a normal human being. Just please do her the courtesy of not seizing that opportunity to get in that little bit of church business while you're in the checkout line. Honor that time of rest. Time away with family. She and Roger are getting a new puppy. She's going to come back from her puppy leave refreshed and renewed. And that's what we want and hope for for her. So please honor that gift of time, if you will. And finally, um, this is uh, with a bittersweet kind of grieving in my heart. Because, you know, um, the scripture tells us that we plan our ways, but God directs our steps. Which means he is sovereign and we are not and things sometimes take a different pathway than what we might have anticipated. Last fall, 
we entered into an ongoing relationship with our dear friend, Jeremy Casella. Jeremy, of course, grew up in Pittsburgh. His parents were longtime members of this church, and we were delighted to have him help us grow in an understanding of how we could sing the gospel out loud, how we could reach back and grab some of those great old hymns and bring them forward with a freshness and newness to help us to worship with a theology in our hearts as well as our voices. And we had hoped that as he and uh, Brooke came together to form a new family, that perhaps their place of residence would be in Pittsburgh Memorial Park, and that would be a wonderful blessing for us. But God has chosen a different blessing for them, and so their family will be setting up, as my grandmother would say, they'll be setting up housekeeping uh, in Nashville as opposed to Pittsburgh. And so today is actually the last Sunday that we will have Jeremy with us in worship, except for when you come back to visit family on occasion, and we may just kind of grab you and pull you up to be part of that church family. They'll be here for a Saturday night later in the month, June 18th, I believe. But uh, this is our last time on Sunday morning. So if you see Jeremy at the end of the service, just tell him how much you love him, love on him and Brooke a little bit. I know they're excited for the future that God has for them, but there's also a lot of struggles in that transition that goes on with a whole number of things. So pray for them, come alongside of them, love on them, and we just want to tell you guys how much we love you, and uh, we just love to have you back any and every time possible. Amen? All right, 1 Corinthians 12. You may have noticed that we skipped over the end of chapter 11. We'll come back to that in two weeks when we're actually celebrating communion because that's a teaching on the Lord's Supper. Seemed like an appropriate place and time to do that. So we're going to go ahead into this conversation about spiritual gifts. And that ties in nicely to the message a couple weeks ago on Pentecost Sunday about the person of the Holy Spirit. Now we're seeing how that Holy Spirit gifts his followers um, for the common good. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, Now about spiritual gifts, my brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. For you know that when you were pagans, somehow or another you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except for by the Holy Spirit. We talked about that on Pentecost Sunday. If you have made that confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, then the Holy Spirit lives in you. In fact, that's the very first statement out of our reanimated spiritual being. As the Holy Spirit breathes into us, that confession comes, Jesus is Lord. Paul continues when he says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Would you say verse 7 aloud with me? Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. It's good to hear us say that word, that phrase together, for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another that extra measure of faith by the same Spirit to another a gift of healing, and by that one Spirit to another miraculous powers, and to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing between spirits, and to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of those tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same Spirit who gives to each one just as he has determined. Just as he has determined. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and dwell in us, that your Spirit would move among us. 
Lord, that we would have eyes of faith to see and ears of faith to hear what your spirit would say to the church. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. And together all of God's people said, Amen. Last week, I had the opportunity to be part of an intensive down on the North Shore, sponsored the two-day conference was an opportunity to take a deep dive into the question of Christians and vocation. That is to say, the calling that job, your thing that you do on that daily nine to five perhaps basis, what does it mean for that to be used for the common good? We met on the North Shore because uh, one of the presenters at this conference was a guy by the name of David Brussel. David is the chief architect and designer to PNC Park. And David is a wonderful follower of Jesus from Kansas City, Missouri, and he shared with us how a biblical worldview informing his faith actually influenced the way he designed our baseball park here in Pittsburgh. It was fascinating to hear how he applied his Christian faith to his vocation as an architect. And he didn't actually secretly hide crosses in PNC Park, and there's no hidden doves or fishes or anything like that. He's actually thought through the idea of architecture from biblical principles and sought to apply those in such a way that they were offered for the common good. Now, in order to be able to do that, David came and spent some time here in Pittsburgh, walking around our city, getting to know us well, listening to us, learning about us, and then he went into the scripture to be able to draw from biblical principle that would inform and shape his design for PNC Park. The formative passage of scripture that really shaped his thinking was in Revelation 22. Revelation 22 is a picture of the new Jerusalem or a picture of restoration. And going through the fourfold movements of biblical drama from creation, fall, redemption, and restoration, David applied his field of architecture. Being visual, as architects are wont to do, he said the image that he has of creation is that of a garden. The idyllic state of Eden, perfect in all of its details. That is God's created norms, his intent for his beloved. There is the garden. But of course, sin enters into the world. And the next visual picture that he drew from the scripture to describe the fallenness and brokenness of the world was the desert. That place that seems to choke out life. That desolate environment where we struggle to survive, where Israel wandered and Jesus was tempted. In that place, it visually represents the fall. David had a harder time coming up with a biblical picture of redemption, apart from, of course, Christ's work on the cross, a picture that would apply to his trade as an architect. And so he decided to say that perhaps the visual image as an architect of redemption was that of a construction site. On a construction site, you and I might just simply see a mound of dirt and, and big equipment and, and raw materials and, and, and people doing their job. But what he sees is beauty coming out of the ashes. He sees this intended picture coming into fruition as what you and I could never imagine begins to take shape in our midst, buying back that which was lost and a sense of redeeming. And then, of course, finally, restoration. And restoration, biblically, David suggested, is found in Revelation 22 and this idea of the new Jerusalem. We start out in a garden, and we end up in a city. And the picture of that city in Revelation 22, verse 1, would influence his design elements 
for PNC Park. If you have your Bibles, turn with me very briefly. It's very in the back of your book. It's not hard to find. Look at the very last book of the Bible, the very last chapter of that book. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1, the inspiration for PNC Park is this. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. Can you imagine in Pittsburgh rivers? The river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Now that takes a little more imagination if you've seen the Allegheny River. A little more imagination there. It flowed from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of that tree are for the healing of the nations. Based on that passage of Scripture, David realized that there was a picture here of what God intends in our cities that he describes as that of flourishing. A great street with a stream that goes down the center, with trees on either side, altogether fruitful, the leaves of which bring healing, and people are just drawn to it and want to be there. It's a picture of community and flourishing. And so going back into our history and back into the scriptures, the design from PNC Park came forth. Because you see, as he walked around Pittsburgh and listened to people, he never heard anybody say, oh, I long for the days of Three River Stadium. He heard people saying, I long for the days of Forbes Field but not for the days of Three River Stadium. Three River Stadium is an architectural disaster. It's a big concrete donut in the middle of a big black asphalt parking lot that basically, in its oval form, said, stay away. There was no community to be built at Three River Stadium. And so out of the rubble would arise not just a ballpark, but a sense of community that would be flourishing. You see, they decided, based on Revelation 22 and verse 1, that one of the things necessary to a ballpark would be having streets, streets with sidewalks that would border the entire ballpark because they knew that if they put streets with sidewalks around that ballpark, it would attract people, and those people would want to build restaurants and hotels, and before you know it, it would be about an actual experience at the ballpark and not just about a ball game. Now, to have an authentic Pittsburgh experience, it would require something uniquely Pittsburgh. You see, whereas Three Rivers Stadium was surrounded in that sea of asphalt, did you know that PNC Park only has 1,500 dedicated parking spaces? for a stadium that seats 38,000. Because by design, the architect and builder wanted at least 50% of the visiting population to actually come across, wait for it, listen, to come across the Clemente Bridge. Crossing a bridge named after our most famous ball player coming over a river together to come to the stadium, you cross with everybody on the bridge, the fireworks are on the bridge at the end of it, and it's a picture of flourishing. And those streets, did you know that last year, Federal Street was closed down for over 81 street parties? And people came out into community. And people from all over the world have come to that ballpark and they sit in that ballpark and they sit there and they just know something about it is good. Something about it is right. Is it great that we've got ball players who are followers of Jesus who on faith night will share their testimonies with the city? You bet. 
Is it great that we have a manager who guides on principles based on the scriptures? Uh-huh. But how amazing that you're actually sitting in a facility that was designed to open you up to the very new Jerusalem of Revelation 22 and verse 1. It was designed to create community. Did you know at the same time, just before PNC Park was built, the big ballpark, of course, that was getting all the rave reviews was Camden Yards in Baltimore. And because of that, everybody expected that PNC Park would be built out of red brick. But in walking around Pittsburgh and observing, what David recognized was that all the private buildings, like the Heinz factory, were made out of red brick. But the public buildings, like the city county building, were made out of large sandstone. And so reaching back into Forbes Field, that's why there's blue steel on that walkway out in left field. And the archways are all reaching back into Forbes Field's history and bringing it forward so that not only our history, but these biblical values of streets that are flourishing would create something that is for the common good. There's an architect, a follower of Jesus, who did not dare think that somehow his job was secular and that my job is somehow sacred. He understood that all vocation, the Latin word vocare means to call. All of us have callings some as architects and engineers, some as teachers, some as doctors, some as designers, some who manage wealth, some who take care of children or seniors. All of us have a calling and vocation that is a gift from the Spirit. Paul writes these words. He says, there are different kinds of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. And then to verse 5 and 6, I think he differentiates those gifts a little bit. In verse 5, he says, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Now, there are two primary passages about spiritual gifts in the Bible, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and also in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we have different giftings of the Spirit that are described as the gift of apostleship, pastors, prophets, teachers, and evangelists. Now, that list is not exhaustive, it is indicative. And what that means is it points to the fact that there are different kinds of service that God has given. We know it's not exhaustive because there's other types of service mentioned in the Bible, such as the serving as elders or serving as deacons or bishops. There's all kinds of manner of different ways of serving that I would suggest to you that ever since we were to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty in the Garden of Eden, you and I have been called to cultivate and keep what God has given to us through our vocare, our vocation, our calling. There are different kinds of service, but the same Spirit who gives them. And so one is an architect, and he uses his gift of architecture for the common good. But there are other gifts that God has given for the common good. I take this guy right here who plays the guitar and writes music and reads music and does stuff by just looking at Gail and she looks at him and they smile at each other and somehow they know what they're doing and it all works. Well, what would happen if Jeremy, who has this gift of God to not only play music but lead people in worship, were to take his guitar and say, hmm, I've got this gift of worship. I'm going to take this gift, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to go home, and I'm just going to play it by myself over here in the corner. You and I would be missing something really special. He's been given this gift. Yes, he can enjoy it himself. Yes, Brooke gets to enjoy it. But it's a larger gift than that. It's for the common good. What if Donna would have said, you know, I've got this song in my heart, but I'm just going to sing it at home today. You thought about it. <laughs> but aren't we all glad that she didn't do that? 
because that gift was given, why? For the common good. This one right here, she does things with homes I can't imagine. She, she does this interior kind of decorating, staging thing. You know, I just put furniture in a room. But she somehow makes it look phenomenal. This guy builds websites. Can't even fathom that. Why do these things exist? Some might suggest they exist for the making of wealth. Well, that's not bad. Making wealth is not bad. Nothing wrong with making wealth. But do we make wealth so that we ourselves alone can enjoy that wealth? Or is that wealth and the ability to make it also a gift from God that is to be used for the common good? You see, whether you're a teacher, caregiver, someone who manages a business or wealth, whether you're a worker, or whether you're a, a manager, whatever it is that you've been given by way of your calling, is a part of thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you and I are given this manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now, there are other ways in which the Spirit works. In addition to these different kinds of service, there are different kinds of working, Paul says. And the Spirit sometimes works through gifts of of a message of wisdom, I hope today might be one of those, a message of knowledge, a greater measure of faith, gifts of healing, miraculous powers, that's the one I want, miraculous powers, right? You read down through this list, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I want the prophecy and the tongues thing, that kind of scares me, but oh, give me the miraculous powers one, that would be great. And yet the scripture says, all of these are from the one and same Spirit, and he gives to each one just as he determines. Which means, if you have said Jesus Christ is Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit lives in you, then his Spirit lives in you and has given you a gift for the building up of the body of Christ. I call these avocational gifts, gifts of edification for the body. Again, Imagine that, that we have the gift of prayer. And you were to say, well, I'm just going to go over here and I'm just going to go in my little prayer corner and pray all by myself, for myself, about myself. What would be missing? I tell you what would be missing. This morning, the people who do intercessory prayer while this sermon is going on, I would be missing someone standing in the gap and praying on my behalf so that this sermon hopefully doesn't stink. You might want to join that prayer ministry and pray a little harder, perhaps. <laughs> but you see, it, it, this is how it works. You've got someone in there praying, right now in the prayer room, interceding for me using their gift. I'm standing in front of you using my gift. And if I went home and said, oh, I don't want to preach this message today in front of everybody. I'm just going to preach it to my dogs in my house. Right? The bottom line is, Something happens when you use your gifts to edify the body of Christ because hopefully as we leave here today and go out into the world, we're better husbands and wives and parents and children. We're better neighbors and coworkers as we apply the principles of the kingdom in all of our life, whether at work or at play. And again, maybe you look down through this list and you go, I don't see my gifting on there. I'm not even sure what mine is. I would tell you again, this list is not exhaustive. It's indicative. There's one blessed soul of this church who sends me a note almost every week saying lovely things about me. And since my love language is words of affirmation, that is really nice. But it builds me up, strengthens me. And that person, I think, has the gift of encouragement. Maybe you have the gift of hospitality. What would happen if you closed your doors to only your household and didn't extend it to the stranger in your midst? There are so many different gifts. And if you're not using those gifts, then what's lacking is the common good. 
So you have this vocational gifting, and you have this avocational, edifying the body kind of gifting. But perhaps the greatest gift of all, and you all have it without exception, the greatest gift of all is the gift of your life. You didn't create yourself. You didn't work hard to become alive. God gave you the gift of life. And the question is, is that gift that was given to you for your own self and enjoyment, or have you been given the gift of your life for the common good? On this weekend, of all weekends, we celebrate and we honor and we remember. Every Sunday we celebrate and honor and remember the life that was given. Why? For his own good? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God gave his son for the life of the world. He gave his son for the common good. And on this particular Sunday, we remember that life and all of the lives that have followed that supreme sacrifice who more than self, country loved. And they gave their lives the greatest gift they were ever given. They gave it back as a living sacrifice, as a gift for the common good. I would suggest to you two ways in which you can dive deeper into this idea of the common good. First is around your vocation, your vocare, your calling in life. I highly recommend to you Amy Sherman's book, Kingdom Calling. Vocational Stewardship for the Common Good. That book will help you look at whatever it is you do and do it truly for the glory of God. Thinking through your calling from a kingdom perspective and a biblical world view. Amy Sherman's Kingdom Calling, Vocational Stewardship for the Common Good. As it relates to these avocational or edifying gifts for the body, you know, you can take uh, spiritual gift tests and inventories and all these kind of things. I think the easiest way to do this, honestly, is find two people who are followers of Jesus who know you really well and aren't afraid to speak truth into your life. And ask them very simply, what do you think my spiritual gifts are? And you'll be surprised. They'll probably give it to you just like that. And you will know it when you hear it, that it resonates as true. Just simply find out what those gifts are. And whether it's your vocation or your avocation, use the gifts that God has given you in the greatest gift of all, which is your life. Not for yourself, but rather for the common good. Let's pray together. Lord, we invite you in your Holy Spirit to come and to rest on us, to dwell in us, to fill us, and as your life animates our very being, to use us for your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, whether it be at work or at play, would your spirit use us for your purposes? We pray these things in Jesus' name, and together all of God's people. Amen.